or something? Okay. The whales have a 15-foot penis. Hold on a sec. I just National want to... Graphic says it. I'm sorry, Ken. You, you cut out there. They have a 15 what? The whales have a 15-foot penis. I didn't cut out. You heard me. Google it yourself. The whales have a 15-foot penis. I'm sorry, Ken. You, you cut out there. They have a 15 what? Are you a pervert or something? Okay. The whales have a 15-foot penis. Hold on one sec, I just want to... Graphic says it. I'm sorry, Ken. You, you cut out there. They have a 15 what? The whales have a 15-foot penis. I didn't cut out. You heard me. Google it yourself. The whales have a 15-foot penis. I'm sorry, Ken. You, you cut out there. They have a 15 what? Are you a pervert or something? Okay. The whales have a 15-foot penis. Hold on one sec, I just want to... Graphic says it. I'm sorry, Ken. You, you cut out there. They have a 15 what? The whales have a 15-foot penis. I didn't cut out. You heard me. Google it yourself. The whales have a 15-foot penis. I'm sorry, Ken. You, you cut out there. They have a 15 what? Are you a pervert or something? Okay. The whales have a 15-foot penis. What's up, heathens? How y'all doing? Uh, I hope y'all are doing all right today. Uh, we have a fresh call-in show that we're hosting. I'm just now kind of getting the word out. This is kind of, I know I kind of planned on doing it yesterday, but, um, you know, kind of a last minute setup thing here. So I'm still kind of trying to get the word out about it. If you guys could help me out by sharing it, uh, sharing it with somebody who thinks that Jesus most likely existed. I'd appreciate that. Um, so yeah, awesome. I hope everybody's doing great this Saturday. Um, we had a pretty pretty good show last night. I got really drunk, um, which y'all could probably tell in the show. Uh, but uh, today we are asking the question of whether or not Jesus existed. And I, I, I titled the stream to be, by the way, did you know that or, or by the way, Jesus probably never. Thank you, honey. <laughs> by the way, um, Jesus probably didn't exist. Um, and I say it like that uh, specifically because it's my position that Jesus probably didn't exist and that I don't think that the uh, evidence actually supports the conclusion that he did. Uh, but I do think that there's still a chance that Jesus could have existed in history. We just need better evidence than what I've ever seen. So we we are going to be um, we're, we're going to be taking a look at that today, and um, I know that we've got at least uh, one caller in the queue already. So that's pretty awesome. If you want to call in and talk to me, it doesn't have to be about whether or not Jesus existed. It can be about whether or not God exists. It can be about just about anything. If you just want to call in and chit chat for a few minutes, we can do that too. So if you guys uh, if you guys want to call in, call in. Uh, like I said, we've already got one caller in the queue, so we're gonna. Go ahead and jump on into that call. What's hey, up, caller? This, this is Daniel, by the oh, way. Hey, Daniel. How so, you doing, man? Pretty good. So um, the reason why I'm calling now is uh, I just want to say thank you to everybody for the support uh, that we have gotten in the past few days. It has been For us, we got a big beeping. So I won't be able to hear again. I don't know why my phone does that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah. Go ahead and say thank you. Yeah. Oh, oh really David. Uh, D David, you, you uh, or, or da uh, Daniel, you keep cutting in and out. I don't know if you got. 
But uh, anyway, I'll, I'll probably so I will talk to you. Oh, uh, okay. I, I'm sorry. I, we were only able to get a couple uh, a couple words here and there, uh, Daniel. Uh, it, like I said, uh, you know, we got your back, man. We're gonna keep uh, trying to push out your uh, your GoFundMe and. Uh, <laughs> I, I I hear David in the background there. <laughs> yeah. I I don't know if you guys can hear me clearly, but hey, huh? Uh, yeah. Anyway, yeah. Um, I'll probably jump back. It, okay. it means a lot. So. Uh, oh, I, 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 I bet it does, man. I, I'm, I'm sure that all, all of this support um, that's been pouring in, I'm, I'm sure that's, that's, uh, that's been a really big uh, surprise for you guys. All right. All right. Oh, I don't know if he's still with us. <laughs> uh, uh, he, yeah, he, he, uh, I, I guess he's gone. Um, Daniel, uh, it, it, I, I hate that we couldn't get uh, a better connection, but, uh, yeah, man, we got your back. Uh, don't worry about it. We're, we're here for you, dude. And, um, <laughs> and, and, uh, we're, we're still going to be here to help you. Okay. So, um, uh, which, uh, if you guys don't know, I do believe that I have his GoFundMe in the description of this video. If you want to go and help Daniel out with funeral costs for his wife, uh, hi him and, uh, his son, Dan uh, David would definitely appreciate any help that they can get, whether that's sharing it out or, or whatever. So, um, yeah, uh, thank you so much, honey, for putting the, uh, the GoFundMe in there. Uh, we do have uh, all three lines open currently for anybody that wants to come in and uh, prove that Jesus existed or God existed. Um, let's see. I'm not a, I'm not as good as as the other shows at getting people to call in. <laughs> nope. Nobody wants to talk with the mythicist, apparently. Um, <laughs> Oh yes, definitely. They just want to bitch on our channels, uh, on their channels, and talk about how wrong, uh, like I am, um, and not actually back up any of their claims. It seems. I know that there were some people on last weekend's fifty thousand uh, subscriber uh, call-in show. Um, let's see. Let's see. Oh, Tangelo should call in. <laughs> that would that would be interesting. I'm sure that I can message him right now. Uh, which I don't know. He's uh, I don't know if he'd be able to call in because I don't have like an international number. Um, oh, here he goes. All right, so we got Rick B in the comments there. Hi, you GE and heathens. Hey there, Rick. Uh, hey there, Alex, who suggested that I get Otangelo in here. Um, so uh, on on Facebook, he's just Angelo, which is kind of weird. I don't know. In other places, he's Grasso. That's his last name, I think. Well, so I'm just saying, he has different. Yeah, he goes by different names. He's in the chat, not the comments. Oh, I'm, sure. I'm sure. I'm sure. I'm sure he's got several sock accounts. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, hey there, Critical Cripple. Uh, hey there, Fran Wilson. Well, um, so uh, interestingly enough, if you guys don't know how I came to uh, the position that I have being mythicism, um, the, how I came to it was I was having conversations on Facebook about uh, things, of, of, hi things of history surrounding uh, Jesus, right? And I uh, got into myself into a position where I was needing to prove that Jesus existed in history, and I'm like, well... Obviously, there's got to be some proof that Jesus existed in history. I should just be able to look it up. And so what I did was I went and I looked for evidence that Jesus existed, and uh, I just didn't find any. Uh, I found uh, apologist attempts to prove that he existed in history, but uh, none of those actually uh, stood up to critical, uh, like a critical look at the evidence. Um, it, it all just basically amounted to people uh, just ad hoc asserting that this person proves Jesus existed, but all of the evidence uh, seemed to just use the Gospels in order to establish that Jesus existed. So it just kind of seemed like the Gospels was the only reason why we think that Jesus existed. Uh, why would you make up stories around that uh, a single guy doing these things? Uh, but then you have to ask yourself, like, well, then why was Hercules made up? Why was why is any fictional character ever made up? Uh, any fictional character that's given like a fleshed out background story, why are they even made up? In this particular instance, it's to satisfy a religious position that Jesus actually uh, was crucified, died, buried, and resurrected again. And so that's what people seem to have needed in the late first century. And that's why the Gospels were written. Um, prior to that, though, I don't think that anybody really considered him to be a physical person here on Earth. Not well. There might have there. There most definitely were some people, but uh, the it wasn't as pigeonholed as a lot of apologists like to make it out to be. Uh, they like to make it out to be that nobody considered him a celestial figure until much later. But that's in fact not true because I think that there's a lot of good arguments to suggest that Paul didn't consider Jesus to be a physical person here on Earth, but that he was a celestial figure. So uh, I know that I've kind of gone over this uh, with a, um, you know, a lot of uh, a lot of times on the channel, but um, it seems that it needs to be regurgitated here, which, again, we still have nobody that wants to call in. It's amazing. They want to talk shit all day in the comments, but once you actually want to get them on the phone or speak to them like face to face, they just don't seem to want to actually call. It's weird, isn't it? It's almost like they don't want to support their positions. More than a flame will call in. <laughs> I mean, okay. Uh, you, you you seem to be you like to talk shit in the comments. <laughs> Give me like ten minutes, okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, we got a caller. Hello, who am I Hello? speaking with? Hey, my name is Vandy, D A N D Y. Vandy? Okay. Um, and I, yeah, I, uh, I'm not in front of my computer, which is normally where I would prefer to be to uh, engage on this topic because, you know, I like to use my Google too. <laughs> but um, I heard that you, you didn't have any callers yet, so I decided I'd uh, call in. Oh yeah, I've uh, been interested. I'm I'm an atheist, um, and I've been uh, interested in um, biblical history and and New Testament um, scholarship and uh, the historical Jesus uh, since for about the last year or so. Sort of when I realized I was an atheist, okay. and I uh, I have come to the conclusion that I do accept that Jesus 
was almost certainly a historical figure based largely on sort of the scholarly consensus. And in particular, sort of the, if I had to point at specific details that um, I find compelling, it would probably be the number one would be Paul mentions meeting Cephas and James, the brother of the Lord, in a way where it linguistically seems to imply that he meant an actual brother. How do you figure that? So because he mentions, I, again, I don't have the passage right in front of me, um, but well, Do you want me to read it for he, you? Yeah, sure. Do you have it? Uh, well, I mean, I can, I can get to it real quick because I, I, yeah, I, I, I don't, I don't have, I don't, I, I don't remember which, uh, I think it was in Galatians, but yeah. It's I can't Galatians, remember exactly. Right, it's Galatians uh, one nineteen. Um, I'm reading from the uh, Greek uh, inter interlinear. Um, interlinear. Uh, it says, uh, "Other, however, of the apostles, none I saw, if not James, the brother of the Lord." Yeah. So the um, way he describes that, he he mentions that I believe right after he mentions that he met um, Peter or Cephas or whatever. And um, that word could be used in a way that, um, and I admit this, it could be used in a way that implies not necessarily a familial relationship, um, mm-hmm. but just a, you know, a fraternal in the non-familial relationship. But to me, the fact that he specifically applies this uh, moniker to James rather than, and, and does not apply it to Peter, seems to indicate to me um, that he is specifying uh, that individual as being the actual physical brother. Uh, but you see the thing, the thing that doesn't convince me there, Vandy, um, is the fact that uh, whenever Paul uses the word brother, he uses the exact same word being Adelphos, which means either, like you said, but this particular verse right here seems to be distinguishing between apostolic and non-apostolic Christians. What, what to you seems to indicate that that is not the case? Um, well, mostly, uh, so I'm not a Greek scholar, but um, to me, it just, it doesn't, it doesn't sound right. It sounds like he's talking about an actual person. And also, even if he is talking about, um, um, if, he, if he's not using it to, to mean a familial thing, he's still talking about individuals who I think he, he at least believes uh, had some sort of relationship with Jesus. And he, he never indicates it, anybody it, as being an eyewitness at all or being a disciple. So, well, I, 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 well, I'm not sure I agree with that. I think that that statement about meeting Peter is um, there's an, you can interpret that as being that they were eyewitnesses to this. He doesn't describe no. um, any particular stories about that. That's true. No, no, no. But he never. I no, no. I, I, I'm so sorry. I've got to correct you. He never, whatsoever, and this is a a hard thing that I'm I'm pressing on here. He never indicates him as being an eyewitness. Or a disciple. Okay, what would that look like? What would that what would look it, like? What would it look like if 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 he was yeah. indicating that somebody was an eyewitness? Well, yeah, yeah I, because I, I mean, when he when he says he went to go and uh, check to make sure that he was teaching the correct gospel. Um, no, no, like, no. You're right. That's not an explicit no, no, that's statement. That's not what he was doing. That's Galatians 2. That's not what he was doing. What he was doing is that he was going to Jerusalem to confer with the other apostles to see if the gospel he was teaching was the same as the other, uh, what the other apostles were teaching. Not that it was the correct gospel, but just that it was the oh, okay, same. Yeah. So it's, he, wasn't, he wasn't trying to collect information. He was comparing his to the other ones. And uh, he was uh, simply uh, – the result of that was that uh, he did not add – like they weren't teaching anything different than he was already teaching. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's so. fair. I guess um, – so I, I gave you the, the one sort of piece that I'm aware of in the text that um, most convinces me. However, to be entirely honest, what um, convinces me is more the fact that it is 
accepted by essentially everybody who's gotten a PhD on this subject. Not everybody, not everybody. Yeah, but, but, I mean, but, you uh, got to admit. Like, I mean, you got to admit that's a really <laughs> poor argument, right? I mean, that's yeah, obviously uh, a poor argument. But, but, but it's it's in in a sense. But okay, let, let me. Can I ask you something real quick? Sure. Okay. Prior to the 1960s. Everybody with a PhD, uh, 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 you know, in, in, in science, in, in chemistry and all of that agreed that the lead that was in a lot of products, including gasoline, was not adding to the lead in our environment. Now, that at that point in time, every expert in the field agreed that the lead in gasoline was not contributing to the lead in the environment and there were even scientists that did direct work on it that sh that where they quote unquote showed that lead in gasoline was not harming the environment. So, uh, would you agree then if you were if you were at that time, uh, it, it, would you agree that lead was in gasoline was not harmful to the environment? Yes, and I would be wrong. Yeah, you would. And do you know how many people? went against this consensus. Well, eventually somebody who convinced somebody. No, 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 no. See, I, I, th this is, this is where a lot of people get it. Wrong. I, I don't, I'm, I don't exactly know what you, what, what, what you're asking there. Okay. My point is, is that one scientist, it was, um, I, I forget his name. Um, one scientist who developed the clean room in order to determine the age of the earth, he found out in, in the process of developing a clean room to determine the age of the earth, found that the lead that was in gasoline was uh, contributing to, uh, you know, the increased lead in the environment. And so he, he presented this places. He told people that it was uh, that, that it was causing more lead to uh, uh, become prominent in the environment. And uh, he was laughed out. Like he was pushed out because the consensus was controlled by the gas companies. And so the gas companies paid people off to do counter research and refute him. And he went as far as to go to the, uh, um, uh, I think it was Antarctica. Uh, he, 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 he went and he got frozen ice that, was not contaminated with the current levels of lead. And what he was able to show, actually able to show, is that the amount of lead in the environment substantially increased once lead gas was being used. Now, keep in mind, this was one person that faced the entire consensus of the scientific community at the time. So using the consensus to generally form like an opinion on a belief is fine. It, it, it's a fine way to go about it, but when yeah, that's, what, that's what I'm doing for the record. Well, I, I understand that, but the problem is, is that we have, well, th there are currently two peer reviewed scholarly books that have examined this and have examined the evidence. And so now instead of just appealing to the evidence, you have to actually show in the evidence why he existed because the, the consensus okay, so has been contested. Uh, yeah, so I, I acknowledge that. So I assume you're talking about Richard Carrier and somebody else, or not? Well, there's Richard and Carrier Price, and Raphael Letaster. I'm not familiar with him. Okay, I'll have to check that out. Um, yeah. Yeah, I would suppose the the other thing is it, it just generally seems more plausible that there was a historical Jesus because – I, di I disagree. I don't think that Paul, dis it, it, he doesn't come across as celestial to me when I read Paul personally. Um, I can sort of see where it comes from. And I think some of the uh, sort of um, uh, hypotheses okay. about uh, the various dying and rising gods and mm -hmm. Zoroastrianism, I, when, I, when I have looked at those in more detail, they have not been convincing. Um, Okay, and I guess so, I guess it, you're you're being very vague about what arguments. So, I, I, in order for me to actually, yeah, okay, sorry, no, 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 that's no, fine. no problem, no problem. Yeah, I, I don't have a, I don't, I don't know the topic well enough to be more specific. 
Oh no, that's fine. Uh, it, it just it, it, it's it's tough for me to actually give you good information um, or responses uh, based on just sort of a vague thing. The the the, the thing though with yeah. like Zoroastrianism and the other cults that w- affected uh, Christianity is called is a thing called syncretism. And uh, uh, I, don't, I don't know if maybe you want, might want to look that up and see what that's like. But basically what syncretism was, was uh, various cult ideas were used uh, in conjunction with Greek Hellenistic religious ideas in order to change Judaism into Christianity, which seems to be what happened. Um now, it, as far as Zoroastrianism goes, whenever you look at it, you're not looking for a one-to-one comparison. Um, if you're going into well, that, obvious, not. huh? Certainly not, I said. Right, uh, but uh, if you look at the elements of Zoroastrianism or the Isis and Osiris cult or any of the other cults that had dying and rising gods, you can see how, like, what elements resonated with the Jews. And uh, they they used in order to create their own version of a dying and rising God, which is Jesus. I mean, you would agree that that Jesus is a dying and rising God, right? Sure. I I don't know enough about whether or not that term dying and rising God has a sort of accepted package in um the scholarly literature. So I, I, I'm hesitant to latch on to a phrase that might carry more baggage that I'm unaware of, but yeah, sure. Okay. Well, I mean, uh, generally with dying and rising gods, you, you, what you have is the savior who dies uh, yeah, for yeah. a person purpose and then uh, is resurrected as a way to, uh, you know, further the, the uh, point of the religious cult. Um, and it, it Sort sort of like a redeemer, uh, almost. So I mean, I would just, uh, yeah, I would definitely, if I were you, I would look into things like syncretism and, um, and uh, the dying and rising God thing. Uh, I don't know if you if you've read much of like Richard Carrier's work, um, uh, or if you have on the historicity of Jesus. But uh, I don't know. Whenever whenever I can uh, host these again uh, and you want to call in, maybe we can have a bit more specific discussion. But as far yeah. as... Yeah, yeah. I, I was going to call in later on in the show, but um, but I, I knew you were aching for callers. So. Oh, <laughs> no, I mean, I would have, you know, I, I would have uh, uh, figured something out. Um, but uh, in, in any case, uh, as far as Paul goes, uh, I really d- I'm, I don't read the text like you do, um, because uh, the Galatians 119 by itself does not read as if he's talking about a blood relative. It actually reads ambiguous to me. I don't know exactly what. Uh, what he's talking about whenever he says brother of the Lord. What I do know, though, is is that when you analyze all of the uses of brother in reference to uh, somebody uh, it, like uh, uh, Paul, um, he, he only mentions it in the fraternal sense ever. So you would actually be special pleading for this one particular case, especially in the face of later on in Galatians when he's talking about bringing along a wife he actually calls the wives sisters because they're sisters of the Lord because that's a prime component of Paul's theology is that once you're a baptized Christian, you're part of the family of God and are therefore a brother or sister of God or the Lord or Jesus, right? So, um, uh, I mean, there's a, there's a lot, there's, there's a mountain of evidence against that. So, I mean, um, unless you mean that Paul was talking about apostles and, and Christians marrying their literal sisters and, and just having more incest, which I mean, honestly, that wouldn't be the first time in Christian <laughs> history. Um, <laughs> Unless he was meaning that specifically, I, I I don't think that the whole reading of brother specifically meaning blood brother as being all that clear. Um, I'm not making the case that it means that he he uh, that it's definitely talking about a fraternal brother. I'm saying that it's ambiguous and you can't really tell, uh, but that the I feel like the evidence leans in the direction of fraternal because of how he uses that particular word. Okay. So um, I appreciate you calling in, though, and having a conversation with me. I, I do have a couple other people on the line. Uh, so, um, oh, yeah, no problem. I'll, I'll hop off then. No problem. <laughs> okay. No, I, I hope that thanks you'll for, come back. Thanks for taking my call. 
Oh yeah, no problem. I hope that you'll call back again uh, uh, whenever I can do this again. And maybe we can have uh, a discussion on another particular uh, topic or, or, or more reasons why uh, why you're not a mythicist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. All right, no man. No problem. Um, thanks for thanks for taking my call, and I'll let you go. All right, man. I'll talk to you later. Bye bye. Bye. Uh, so there's somebody in the, uh, comments that is saying that Jesus is recorded in the Roman census. Um, well, I mean, considering that Jesus is a common name, I would expect uh, a, a census to turn up a few Jesuses at the time, um, in the first century, uh, cause there were, there was a census there, um, in the first century. But, uh, the problem is though, is that you're not going to find like a Jesus Christ or anybody that really resembles the Jesus of Christianity. So, all right, let's get to the next caller who apparently called in last weekend, which was the 50,000 call in show. Hello caller. Who do I have? Hello. Um, how are you? Uh, I'm doing good. How are you? Doing great, doing great. So my plan was I wanted to engage with your um, Mythicist playlist before I called in, but I only had enough time to watch one or two videos. So I mostly, if it's just if it's okay, I wanted to ask you a couple questions and then uh, keep digging and then maybe call in um, in the future. Is it cool if I ask you a couple questions about? Oh yeah, sure. Hold on. Uh, who, uh, well, first off, uh, uh, um, can can I have your first name? Oh, sorry. Yes, my name is Mark. Mark. Okay. Awesome. All right, Mark. Cool. So you got a couple of questions. Yeah. So I know most scholars acknowledge um, about six or seven letters um, that Christians consider to be written by the Apostle Paul to be authentic. Um, do you consider any of the 13 letters in the uh, New Testament to be authentic written by um, the Apostle Paul? Well, yeah. I mean, I generally go with the uh, the seven that most scholars uh, would say was written by Paul. Okay, okay. Because I know I know Richard Price doesn't doesn't acknowledge that. So, okay, awesome. So, do you who do you think Jesus's disciples were? Do you think he had disciples? Because Paul says he met with them. So no, do he you doesn't. think Jesus had disciples, and what do you think their role was? Oh, well, you don't think he exists. Who do you think those people Paul was speaking of were? Well, uh, for one thing, Paul doesn't actually talk about the disciples. Paul doesn't talk about – so when he when he refers – so I know you were talking about um, with your last call, for example, the brothers of the, the, brothers of the Lord. Who, right. who do you take these people to be? Uh, well, I mean, the, the text, uh, in, in the text with Paul, it's not really uh, all that clear. Uh, there's several different possibilities. Brothers, brothers of the Lord or a brother of the Lord could just be a general baptized Christian. There could have been a, a sect of Christians, or not sect, but like a, um, a level uh, of, of uh, Christian, I guess you could say. Uh, that that yeah. was known like a group within Christianity that was known as the Brothers of the Lord, um, but I, I think that the most parsimonious and the most likely thing is that brother or Brothers of the Lord was just uh, general Christians, um, considering how Paul references like um, fellow female Christians, being that he calls them sisters. He also uh, regularly refers to other Christians or other apostles uh, as brothers. Of the Lord. Well, I don't, I don't know if he actually calls apostles brothers of the Lord. He's very specific about mentioning how they are apostles, but other other Christians that he names, like um, Ti- I want to say Titus is one, uh, Timothy I think yeah. is another one. He calls them brothers, unless they are literally his brothers. Then it would seem like you know he's using it in the fraternal sense. Uh, so the disciples, I don't think ever actually existed. Um, I think that the later authors of the Gospels picked up on uh, prominent figures in the early church and made them disciples of Jesus. Um, So uh, considering the fact that Paul never actually talks about anybody being a disciple— uh, or, or walking with Jesus or, or knowing Jesus personally before he died. Uh, I, I 
highly doubt that any any of the apostle or not apostles, but any of the disciples uh, were actually real people in history. Okay, so I, so of course that view hinges on not on not taking the account the um, what's written in the Gospels into account. And my understanding of the little I've engaged with Richard Carrier's work is that in his first of several books on mythicism, it was about methodology, and he mm-hmm. writes about for you know reasons A through Z is why the um, the Gospels should cannot be mined for any historical information. And then when looking at only ad- additional information, um, th- there's, I guess, less meat you're able to extract. So wh- well, what is your view on, um, what is your view on that? Well, technical, well, I, I believe Carrier's technical position is that we can't know exactly what in the new Testament is reliable history or what was actually said, uh, due to the mm. fact that it, it doesn't cite any historical sources for the information and the only information that it really cite or the only source that it ever really cites is, uh, you know, scripture. And also the fact that these gospel writers uh, used other works to inform their works. Like it, it just, yeah. it, it, it ultimately renders them Im- nearly impossible to determine what is true history and what is not as far as specific claims about Jesus. Okay. So I, I agree that in like coming, if somebody's coming from a non-believing standpoint and they look at the gospels and they say, wow, there's a lot of legendary stuff in here that yes. I, I, I think both those who would acknowledge Jesus and would not acknowledge it's a difficult task. But my understanding is that based on everything you just said, um, he says, we can't, or, it's so it is so difficult to extract historical information that we are not going to entertain them as sources, like like at all. So even if it's difficult, um, he's not going to try at all. Do you think do you think that they should be completely off the table? I don't think that there is anything uh, in the Gospels that we can know is historical because there's no actual corroboration either outside of the Bible. Uh, or within Christianity in order to suggest that they recorded actual history. Uh, so, no, I, I, I don't think that the Gospels can be used to validate G- that Jesus existed. Um, so, yeah, I, I, th- I think that answers your question. Okay, but what about the same, um, the same tools historians would normally use to extract historical information? So, okay. Um, yeah. Well, I'm just kind of, so can you, can you actually be a bit more specific about what these oh, tools yeah, are? Oh, yeah, 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 of course. So, so for example, um, for example, multiple attestation, for example, criterion of embarrass- embarrassment, um, for example, um, it's just like the, the, the normal tools in the toolbox that historian would use. To Those are not normal tools in, in a historian's toolbox that they regularly use. Uh, so multiple attestation is is used like it, it's good to have multiple attestation about something happening but the problem is is that when you actually critically look at the gospels you've only got one source there so that's not multiple attestation so i mean you, you no, don't have on. multiple you attestation the gospels are only one source yes the gospels you just said only they count for multiple sources well, no, no, no. As far as sources for Jesus, like they, they do pull from multiple. So like, for instance, uh, the Gospel of Luke yeah. and, 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 then later, and, and then later on Acts, uh, that, that particular author uses uh, Homer's Iliad, Odyssey, uh, uh, Josephus. Like they, they use a lot of different things to inform their fiction, but it's ultimately still fiction. And considering that all of the Gospels use Mark as their source, Mark is the only source as far as Gospels go. They count as one source because it all hinges on Mark. There, there's nothing pr- previous to Mark that Mark uses, at least he acknowledges that he uses in his Gospel. Now, Mark's theology is informed by Paul, uh, but... Uh, I and I think that he probably did use Paul for some information, but 
even even if you wanted to go that route, I, I I'm I'm being very generous with even saying that the gospels count as like one possible source. Because if, if you want to sure. ultimately if you want to ultimately talk about it, really Paul is the only source that is contained within the Bible. Okay, so so I'm sure you've heard the it seems like there is three main points that I just heard from what you just said. And I'm I'm sure you know the typical um, Christian responses to them, but let, let me let me bounce these off of you. So first you said um, it is Luke. I, I'll address them in reverse order. So you said that, um, th- th- uh, like, there may be historical stuff in there, but ultimately it's fiction. But mm-hmm. for, for the sake of, um, like, let's say building a cumulative case for Jesus, you don't. You can acknowledge they are like, like, like mostly historical fiction, and still try to um, try to see. If you can extract, but for example, I know people like using the Spider-Man example, right? Like, for example, just because you know New York exists doesn't mean Spider-Man exists. But if you, but if you found a bunch of um, ancient documents that were in like the, the genre of historical fiction written by different people in the way they described the city, um, all in, in, like like uh, it multiply attested that this city existed, you could infer well these historical fiction um, uh, stories probably took place in a city that more likely than not existed. So I don't think it follows that if, um, uh, even if you agree that they're mostly fiction, that there's not chunks you can extract from that. So you made two other points, but I, I don't want to monologue. So I, I, I guess, what's your thoughts on that? Well, I guess I don't understand how mundane facts that are worked into an, a, a fictional story uh, can somehow prove uh, uh, made up portions of this same fictional story. Like, I guess I, I don't understand no, no, that, why. That's not what I'm saying. That, I'm saying it just proves those facts. And then like, the, so like, like it, it can prove a couple specific facts. And then those facts in combination with other facts, say from Paul or Tacitus or Ignatius of Antioch or whomever can, can make the cumulative case more probable than not. So I don't think that they prove the story is true. But it, well, I, I so, could have misunderstood your wording. But you said because they're fiction, we can kind of dismiss them. And I don't think that logically follows. I think well, it means so, we can try to pick out. Yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Well, I, I was just going to correct you. Uh, so Tacitus, yeah. if if the poor, if the part in Tacitus was legitimately written by Tacitus, uh, he would have ultimately gotten his information from the Gospels. Uh, that uh, and and what I mean by that is is that he was talking with Pliny the Younger, who was interrogating Christians, and Christians would have known uh, the theology preached in their Gospels. I, I mean, just to be a Christian, you would have to know those things. So, I mean. Uh, you know, ultimately, Tacitus' information would have already come from the gospel. So that's not really a, uh, another source. That's just reiterating an already supposed source. Then you got Ignatius of Antioch. He was a uh, Christian who already knew the gospels. His information comes from the gospels. So still, you have a refer- uh, uh, somebody who's referencing the gospels. It still just leads back to the gospels. So, I mean, you're not actually providing separate sources here. You're providing the same single source. Okay, but okay, but he, he, I, I feel like you're saying a lot of things that perhaps could be made probabilistically as authoritatively. Because it is, I, I am abs- I, I'm less familiar with Tacitus, but I'm absolutely certain, or like just, just from hearing scholars discuss this, that it is not a commonly held view. Or like, in fact, the vast majority of even, on, I know a number of, uh, secular um, scholars who hold that Ignatius of Antioch had um, th- there is no evidence that he had previously seen the Gospels. Now I'm not saying like that because these scholars says it that that's true because that's an appeal to authority. I'm just saying specifically you're saying all of these things authoritatively that yeah. I, I'm flagging in my head and I'm saying well I, 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 that, that that's not obvious to me. Wait wait so so like, hold like, on. What evidence How... do you have specifically that what evidence do you have? Um, be, because, like, like, what evidence do you have that Ignatius of Antioch was copying from the Gospels? Because the vast majority of folks I've heard on this, be it Jesus Seminar, seminar be it Bar Ehrman, have said they have absolutely no evidence that Ignatius of Antioch copied from the Gospels. Well, I just now, I didn't say no. Too, hold, I know hold not, on. Yeah, I'm sorry. Hold on. I didn't say that Ignatius of Antioch copied the Gospels. I said that or Ignatius was informed of, by them. Was informed by them. 
Well, what, I mean, what evidence was there of that? When, when was he writing? Can you tell me when he was writing? Uh, to the best of my recollection, it was a bit after 100 AD. Yeah, and you don't think that Christians in the second century knew about the Gospels? I have no idea. I'm saying all you can do is look at what he, you're the one making the claim. What I'm saying is it seems that when secular scholars that I know of, I, I, don't, I don't have a background in Greek or Aramaic or whatever it may be. When secular scholars look at him, I, they, they tell me, I mean, I, I don't know. Again, I don't, I don't know Greek or Aramaic, but they tell me that it's, they don't um, see that he was, his writing was informed by the, by the Gospels. So if you're disagreeing with them, that's fine. I'm, I don't intend to appeal to authority. I'm just asking you, since you're making a positive claim, what is the evidence for that? Uh, what, what is the evidence that Christians in the second century would have known about the Gospels? What is the evidence that in his writing, it is informed by the Gospels? Because, like, like for example, you can tell that um, uh, Matthew or Luke drew from, drew from Mark because of the wording. In some of the later... Um, uh, in, in, in writings of different later church fathers, you can tell that they're quoting the Gospels, right? With him, that's not the case. And it, it is also the case that in Antioch at that time, we don't have evidence that at that point, official um, canonized Gospel accounts had reached there. Well, no. So, I mean, that, because, that's one problem that you have right there is that the, like, the, like what we know of as, like, the Gospels— uh, didn't uh, actually come together until the mid second century. Uh, so but that, that goes it, against your point. If you that goes against your point. No, it doesn't. I don't know. Because I don't you, know. No, no, no. I I don't know why you think it goes against my point. I'm just saying the canonized like like uh, the the four the four or three. Three, three to four by the mid second century. I guess it'd have to be the four, uh, the all four of the gospels that were eventually written and accepted by the majority of Christians came together in the yep. mid second century. That does not mean that it works against me because in when Ignatius uh, of Antioch was writing, there would have been several gospels, and I do believe Ignatius of Antioch also records different gospels that were being written about Jesus, like one where uh, the gospel proclaimed that you know he was uh, not known while he was here on earth, that he died without yeah. anybody ever knowing who he was, and that he only revealed himself in the sky as a star after he resurrected. That's that's one particular uh, gospel that he attests to that is, is uh, no longer available to us, okay? But to suggest Correct. that a Christian in the second century did not have some kind of access to what 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 they would know of as the gospel or the good news about Jesus Christ, uh, and, and, and enough to be called like a Christian. I mean, I, I just I, I don't find that to be very plausible. Um, I, now I don't okay, know. Ignatius, my question, oh, hold clarify, on. Can I ask a quick point of clarification? I'm, I'm okay. sorry. I, I, want, I, just, I want to make sure I understand you. Um, did you so? I, the original point was you said Ignatius of Antioch. I, this is also like very tangential to what we were saying earlier, but I'm just interested because some of what you're saying is actually new to me, so I find it interesting. So you said Ignatius of Antioch um, does not count as a second source co to compare to – you said the Gospels, the four Gospels count as one source. In Ignatius of Antioch, it counts as the same source. But now you just said oh, he had access to a different Gospel, not before that we that – you say are canonized uh, in the mid second century. So if he had access to a different gospel before the four that were canon or that were written or whatever in the mid second century, does that not make him a, does that not make it a second source? No, no, no. A different uh, gospel. No. Well, for one thing, he never cites, uh, he never cites where he gets his information from. And uh, according to, uh, you know, my he has a, it seems like he has yep. a very poor knowledge of what the gospels are. Um, and but, it but says that they, it's different gospels. No, hold on. The, their only attestation to a historical Jesus is entirely dependent on a demonstrated and often poor knowledge of the gospels. 
These letters appear to be the first extant Christian texts that add any historical defi uh, historicity defining elements to the Christian creed. All of the creeds of the first century lack any clear identifying elements of uh, historicity. The Ignatian creeds conspic uh, conspicuously pack those creeds with clear identifying elements of historicity. So, I mean, that's that's what my app says. And uh, I, I would say that Ignatius of Antioch is regurgitating things that already existed, so that inherently means that he can't be a second source. Now, if he could somehow, uh, you know, identify a source that he was pulling from as being some kind of eyewitness to what was happening, and we could, uh, you know, it, it was an actual verified source or something, I mean, mm -hmm. I think that, that that would help. But as far as Ignatius of Antioch uh, it goes, he's far too late to give us any kind of independent source for Jesus, regardless of how many Gospels he, he informs us about. It's never okay, been well, my position think, that there argument, weren't multiple yeah. Gospels. Correct. Yeah, so I, I agree with that. But I think, I think the argument would be that he, that he is drawing upon earlier traditions, like, like the ones you said, you said maybe um, uh, like, like Jesus, Jesus didn't have a, um, uh, an earthly form, which he was arguing against, for example. But they would, it wouldn't be that he was the source. It would be he is like discussing an earlier tradition, which pushes the data up. And since you think the Gospels are written later, that in the, you may not find the sources convincing, but I, I don't think you can make the claim you made earlier that it is the same source of the Gospels. You can say there's two unconvincing sources. You can say there's two sources that are so late that are subject to legendary development. I don't care. But I, I, I was specifically t targeting what you said earlier about it's one source. You said Ignatius is the same source as the Gospels. So well, Ignatius is that your position? Well, I I Ignatius would not be an independent corroboratory source. I Igna Ignatius would be a secondary source, if anything. But again, he doesn't cite like where he gets his information from or anything like that. So Ignatius would not, not be an independent. Gospel. Hold yeah. on. Hold on. Ignatius okay. would simply not be an independent source for Jesus uh, it, it, because of those reasons. So he's just simply not an independent source. Define independent. Independent would be like uh, in, uh, independent of uh, in, in, in any any of the gospels that were going around that were written f far after Jesus supposedly died. And I mean, I've I've it's never been my position that there weren't other gospels that went around because there obviously were. Ignatius yep. he he relays one of those such gospels where Jesus is is never heard of while he's here on earth. Like I said before, it's completely different than the gospels that that Ignatius would know. But I mean, he's not saying that this is my gospel. He's talking and discussing other like heresies and shit that were going around. Co correct. So I, I, I did the claim that I hear people make about him is he cites an earlier or he references an earlier tradition, which is separate from the Gospels in that earlier tradition from which he draw, draws is evidence of a second source that discusses because, because he's not arguing that Jesus didn't exist. He was arguing contra that position from that source. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's the source. And then he was drawing from something else saying arguing contra that position so i think all so i nobody is saying that like he wrote the gospel i think what they're saying is he is he is drawing upon other sources to make claims which which have we cannot connect to the four gospel accounts and therefore it's a second source or, or, well no no, no I, but I think, but, but you see it's a, it's a hypothetical source it's just like q Q is a hypothetical source yeah. that informed Mark, but uh, I mean, if if you don't have like an actual source or, or and an, an, like like a, a a a good citation of it, like with a name or like, because you can't tell me who these people were, you can't tell me like what what group of Christians were holding to this position, just that it was another heresy going around. We don't have any kind of indication of when it was written, um, where it was written, or, or how long it lasted. Like we don't have any kind of information like that. So, uh, could uh, the, 
it's always been the mythicist's position that multiple different yep. contradictory gospels were going around. So this really doesn't contradict yes. what what mythicism already claims. Okay, I think maybe a better ex- uh, I I see what you're saying by the comparison with Q. I think maybe a better example would be um, like M or L, right? Matthew or Luke. So this is this actually gets into the second point you made earlier. So you were That's you were talking M- about how I'm sorry. I- M and L are the exact same as Q. Oh no 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 no. Okay, I'm I'm glad you said this. No, so so so. It, 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 within Luke, right? D- divide Luke into three sections. Divide, divide it into three sections. So about a third is taken from Mark, right? You, you said that. You said that earlier. About a third is literally taken from Mark, almost word for word. About a third is independent to that gospel, and about a third is is shared between Matthew and Luke. It's, yeah, Matthew and Luke. So what's shared between Matthew and Luke is Q. What is just in Luke that. What is just in Luke is L. So I think that is a better analogy to what you were saying earlier about Ignatius. So the reason being is because we know that L, we don't know who, like. Uh-oh. So it could have been this source, but everybody acknowledges it. Like I, I don't, I don't, I, I would never say Q is a source. It's just conjecture. But we do know that L, which is just found in Luke, and M, which is just found in Matthew, were drawn from some other stuff. We don't know from whom. We don't know how long they circulated. We don't know anything else. But I think that's a better example because we know it was drawn from something. Whereas with Q. It's just like a theoretical, it's just conjecture. And, and everybody, or most scholars I know acknowledge L, that. No, so L and M are just yeah, conjecture. Sorry, They're I'm, speculative too. No, no, no. Okay, okay. So it, it is. No, the, yeah. The, hold, the hold, hold, hold on, hold on. You, you just monologue for a yeah, bit. Let, let, me, let me answer. L and M are just as speculative as Q is. Because you cannot actually prove to me that L, like the the sort the the content that you're calling L and M weren't just something yep. that the authors of those gospels made up. You're ad hoc assuming that it had to come from somewhere else. Like apparently, for some reason, mm-hmm. nobody had any kind of creative thought in the first century except for people that I guess originated it. Those were the only people that were capable of creative thought. The people that originated. It. Oh, okay, correct. So, so then, so then the relevant question becomes because you said, and you said we don't. Know, well, let me restate this before I respond. I just want to make sure I, I heard you correctly. You said that we cannot be certain that M and L um, draw from an independent source because we don't know if the author just like made it up. For example, did I did I hear you correctly? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So then that's, that's where we get into, um, uh, for example, do we have a reason to believe that the materials like that parts of the material just found in M or just found in L, um, may, uh, have some like, like may, for example, um, align with the writings of Paul, um, or may, for example, uh, like, like, like just multiple attestation, for example. So I think, I think you can find nuggets in M and in L that make it more probable than not that they drew off. Like, for example, there's, um, there's like, like you can do textual analysis on um, to see if certain sayings were not certain, but, but probably drew from uh, oral traditions in Aramaic, which are found in M and L. So we don't know how many traditions, right. Or if they're any good, but I, I'm just saying, we can say they're probably independent. Like you can't, than 50%. you can't say that they're probably in. Like that's that's purely like, speculative and ad hoc. Like you can't say that. I, I I didn't I didn't understand what you were saying. I'm sorry. I said that that's purely ad hoc and you can't actually come to that particular conclusion. Also, I think the Aramaic argument is just really piss poor. I mean, are you trying to suggest that Jesus was the only person walking around talking Aramaic? So actually, 
my case could be um, that. Like, at, at this point, we're not even that far yet. All I'm saying is that is that by it being in Aramaic, by there being certain sayings, I'm not saying that means it's attributed to Jesus, right? That's a different argument. I'm not making that case with you. I'm saying is that means it was drawing on a previous source. That's what, that's all what I'm saying. I I'm not saying that me that means somebody remembered exactly what Jesus said. I'm saying it makes it more probable than not that M and L were drawn from other sources, such that we can say it's, it, they were not just completely ad hoc made up. That's all I meant. So. So you're telling me that the people that wrote the Gospels, these highly educated Greek writers, which they we know that they would have had to have been highly educated and knew uh, multiple languages, including Aramaic, in order for them to be able to write and understand Aramaic, you're trying to tell me that they couldn't make up shit in Aramaic? Couldn't make up shit in Aramaic. Um yeah. I'm, I'm I'm trying to even think of what that means. Um, well, okay, I'm, so I'm so saying, what, yeah, I'm what I'm sorry, saying is, hold on. What I'm saying is, is that you're trying to suggest that it, purely speculative and ad hoc, by the way, that uh, anything in Aramaic most likely came from an earlier source, but uh, mm-hmm. I, that kind of hinges on the idea that these highly educated rabbi and, and Christians that that knew multiple languages, including Aramaic therefore could not just make up these Aramaic sayings. That, okay, that's, that, I, that's not exactly what I'm saying. What I, it's not anything in Aramaic. It's, for example, there's certain, certain uh, turns of phrase or certain amounts of syllables or, set, or statements of certain length are patterns of what we know are oral, were oral traditions in the Near East of that time. So it's not just anything you can translate to Aramaic. Basically the whole thing, or much of it, you can translate to Aramaic. It's specific. Well, it's, I'm sorry, go ahead. I mean, I was just going to say that uh, I, I think that oral tradition uh, was how uh, the gospel was spread prior to that point. Um, mm-hmm. So, I mean, uh, I, but, 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 that doesn't mean that there was like so, like like uh, the oral the oral tradition argument uh, means that there's no physical like evidence of the oral tradition. So there's no way that you can tell if it was oral tradition or if it was just something that they made up. Uh, it also, even if you could prove that it did come from an earlier source, there's no way to verify that that earlier source would either oral tradition or not. Uh, I actually traces back to a a you know historical person named Jesus. Um, there were obviously you know multiple different ideas that were going around in the first century, uh, and and Paul even warns against this in his writings. So I, I guess I just yeah. I, I, I considering that math that that Luke was most likely written at the end of the first century. I mean I I just I I don't see how this particular argument leads us to like uh, multiple attestation of Jesus Christ or anything like that when the mythicist hypothesis uh, itself says that there will be a lot of different ideas about Jesus, but that's because there was never really an actual historical Jesus to begin with to actually verify these things off of. So, I mean, uh, if you look at multiple attestation, it's just the preponderance of the different gospels that could have been going around or that were going around. Just because there were a lot of different versions does not actually get you back to a historical person. A multiple attestation, whenever historians use it like correctly and not just apologists, would be like multiple people that independently testified to this thing happening. But the problem is, is that the only person that's contemporary enough to actually give us that kind of account is Paul. When he talks about him, it's not exactly clear whether or not he was talking about a celestial Jesus or a Jesus that existed on earth. But also, more importantly, nobody else records this particular rabbi that was going around and that caused such a kerfuffle that it, it, you know, that he was uh, executed and then, you know, his, his, uh, his, his tomb was found empty the next day. That's, that's not anywhere attested 
at all. But um, I don't know. I, we've been on the phone for a little bit now, um, and I do have a couple other callers to get to. Um, I really appreciate your call, and maybe we maybe next time I do this, we can we can discuss a, a little bit more in depth. Yeah, yeah, that um, that sounds great. Thank you so much for taking my call, man. No problem. I appreciate you calling in. All right, have a good one. All right, you too. Bye. Bye. All right, that was a really engaged discussion. <laughs> Um, all right, let's go ahead and take the next caller. All right. Hello. Hey, this uh, is, uh, hi, hi, sorry. Go ahead. Hey, what's up, John? This is Joel more than a flame. How you doing, man? Oh, hi, more than a flame. How you doing? I'm all right. Uh, I wanted to, if, if, if you're willing, I just wanted to get a couple things out of the way. Cause we've had some miscommunication. It feels like, um, I don't, for, for, from my point of view, I don't feel like I was running my mouth necessarily. I was a little bit uh, disappointed because I gave you an offer that wasn't based on a belief system. I, and I'm sure you read the email. Um, I gave you an offer and I actually offered you a, a, an amount of money that had no risk to you. It was purely reward. I said, I'll give you $300. I'll send it to you through Cash App um, if you can prove me wrong on this one thing. And I'm curious as to maybe you're busy and didn't see the email. Um, and that's kind of what kept me bringing that situation up because I was confused because I gave you, you know, a simple offer, simple instructions, and just said, if you prove me wrong, I'll wire this money to you immediately. And, and I, I do my best to be a man of my word. So I actually okay. upped it. You'll remember. I know you have to. It started I, at I 100, do, I, and then so I sent you another email. So I, I do remember uh, your email. I also remember reading it. And, um, and, and immediately disregarding your proposition. I don't remember what the proposition is. Uh, I just remember it being ridiculous. And, um, I, I decided okay. not, not to answer you, but, uh, I, I mean, I don't know if you want to pose the question to me, uh, you know, right here on the air. Uh, I mean, that's fine. Here's, well, just, here's the thing. Like, I don't want it to feel like it's some intellectual war to, that we're going through. I want to have a legitimate just conversation with you. You have okay. your position. I have mine. I'm not against you in, in a way that I want to walk away from this conversation. Like I won something that's not, I'm not trying to feed a sense of pride or anything, but okay. I appreciate you giving me a chance. So I'm going to bring up what that thing was I sent you about, because for me, I'm super cynical and I'm very skeptical. Um, so I almost believe nothing. So I sometimes investigate things to a degree that people would think would make me crazy. Um, because I don't take people's word for it. So when I just listen to you guys go back and forth, um, at the end of the day, even, and this is my opinion, it feels like no matter what somebody brings to you, we can always disregard it as whether it was legitimate evidence, because we still have people that, you know, we, we can't even necessarily say, oh, it was written in history because we have a generation of children that are going to see 9-11 was a, a Middle Eastern terrorist attack from, you know, some Can we please not go into that? Can I'm just going to tell well, you right now, they, I do not entertain 9-11 conspiracy theories. So, okay. Well, so here's, here's all I'm saying is there's a lot of things written down as history that we can't always trust. Okay. So let's, even if it's not just that, when I talked to you the first time, maybe a month ago, one of the first points I brought up is the fact, and you said that, it, and you kind of felt like you dismissed it. Um, I said, we've been lied to about basically everything and that there is a massive organization, the, the Freemasons who operate in almost, I mean, in everywhere. I mean, they are controlling the majority of what happens. Um, and you it felt like you dismissed that uh, mm -hmm. as being a fact. Um, I mean, are you aware of that, right? I know that no, the for, for someone to be as knowledgeable as you, the world. there's no way you, you haven't come across that, right? The Freemasons are not controlling the world. I didn't say they're controlling the world. I said controlling a lot of what goes on. What do you think they do? Can I ask you that? Uh, what, I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not a Freemason, so I have no idea. Do you know what they believe? Sorry, I just pulled up your email and I immediately remembered why I fucking closed it in the first place. Okay. 
<laughs> that was my first point of evidence um, as to us being lied to. But go ahead. Read okay, it. so yeah, so so uh, everybody, uh, so uh, everybody, just so just so you know, basically, it's a conspiracy theory about how we're. Not, I've done this myself, John. I've done this I myself. I, oh, hold I've, on, I've hold actually on. looked this up. I will mute you if go you ahead. do not let me talk. Go ahead. My bad. Basically, if you go to the depart the Treasury Department's website and you uh, set it up very specifically. And you put in your birthday, uh, two digits, four digits, uh, like um, 11, 1984, and then hit calculate. And then you got to multiply, like, you got to multiply your number by a certain amount. And then apparently that's how much you're worth. And apparently the US government, like, has bonds taken out on all of this. And so we're all worth something to the government. Or something like that. Um, so I mean, it. Uh, I mean, this is literally like picking it? numbers out of the air and then claiming that some, uh, like, like uh, the Illuminati is going to kill you or something. Like it. Not it, at all. This Can is I ridiculous. It? You give me a chance. Huh? Would you give me a chance to explain it from my live? Here I am, a living man, giving you my straight up witness testimony. Is that cool? Uh, okay. All right. So here's 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 what it is. Um, what I said, and I would have been cool with you sharing the whole email right on your screen. Um, when you look at the back of your social security card, okay, we've been listed as surety for the debt of the corporation of the United States of America, which is a corporation. What I said to you, John, is when you get your bills in the mail, they're all capital letters. Okay. Um, a corporation legally is all capitals. A proper noun is an uppercase letter followed by lowercase. This is not a conspiracy theory. I've, I've done this myself and about four or five of my family members. And if you look at your social security card and you flip it over and you look at the bottom right hand corner on the back, we're not talking about your nine digit social, the back of your card will have a letter followed by like five or six numbers. It'll be red ink or black ink. That's the savings bond, the serial number savings bond. This isn't some voodoo magic. You cal cal calculate all these things. I gave you easy instructions. You basically go to that treasury website you punch in your birthday, that's the issue date. When you were born, that birth certificate is literally a bond paper. We are the surety for the debt. This is why you can continue to watch uh, a government print money with nothing to back it because people don't realize they're the ones that are actually backing it. Um, so the dollar is not quite gonna crash like a lot of people think it will. Um, we haven't had physical money in the United States since 1933. Um, these aren't conspiracies, I think it is, not cool that you dismiss them as conspiracy theories when you ask for physical evidence and then I provide you with something that this can be not, proven. I offered you a three hundred dollar no, no, no. reward. Okay, to prove listen, me wrong listen, and you listen, didn't even okay. it. For, for, hold on, hold on, hold on. Okay. So first off, no matter what I say to you, as far as this goes, you're not gonna be convinced by it. So your claim of you a three hundred dollar you're basically saying you get three hundred dollars if I convince you that I'm wrong. And I'm just simply no. not gonna be able to convince you that you're wrong. No, John, John, all I said was you could straight I don't need your social security number, man. I said you you look at the back of it, there's numbers in the corner. No. You could I, film yourself, type it in, and if it doesn't pop up with a number I will send you $300. That's a very simple, you don't need to convince me. Show me you punch it in with your correct birthday and that number on the back of your social. And if it doesn't pop up with the savings bond that has a value, then I will send you $300. I'm not asking you to change my mind. I'm saying prove it to me factually. You wouldn't even attempt it. If you go look at your birth certificate, your I last name is in all capital letters. Your first name will be all capital followed by lowercase. That's not and in law. That's called one to one correspondence. They're not. That's not even two different languages being spoken at the same time. Oh, I'm not man. here to argue. I gave you an offer and you refused to even attempt it. And, no, and yeah, because this is a crazy I'm conspiracy just, theory, man. Listen, I'm glad that you called in today. I, I mean, unless you want to talk about Jesus existing or God existing or something like that, we can. I, we can, John. John, this is no. the problem. Is when I give you something that can be proven that's not. Something you call a conspiracy. That's not a conspiracy. You could take your soul. Go look at the back. All your viewers, man, stop. You have 125 people. They can take out their social and look at the back of their card. I'm sorry, Rich. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. Tell me I'm, I'm going to have to hang up on you. Goodbye.
<laughs> Jesus Christ. I fucking free Freemasons are calling up our savings bonds and shit. <laughs> I'm the silly one. Okay. Well, we got another caller. Uh, he's They've been hanging on for a while now, so I appreciate that. Hello, caller. Uh, who do I got? Hi, D.E. This is Fran. Um, I'm Hi. A, an atheist, and um, I love Judaism, and I think it's really important. I kind of follow in the mythicist camp, basically mm-hmm. because from a Jewish perspective, it was occupied territory by Rome. And the Jewish people at the time, they were, they were like all sorts of people looking for a messiah. Uh, Bar Kokhba was one that the Jewish people thought might have been a a messiah because he was political and he was um, challenging Rome. And of course, Judea was just crushed from that. Um, And so I think the narrative with Jesus could very well be just some yearnings for a messiah. And Mm -hmm. so, you know, it, it doesn't really prove that there was, it doesn't give evidence that a certain man, maybe an itinerant rabbi, existed by that name. But I think it would, could have be could have just come out of a yearning for uh, wanting a better life. Uh, yeah, I definitely agree with that. And there's uh, actual evidence uh, of it in Philo of Alexandria. Uh, you know, he was uh, relating. Uh, you know, uh, an archangel figure in Judaism in in the early first century uh, with the suffering servant or the uh, the Messiah figure. Uh, so, and and the way that Philo describes this particular archangel is the same way that Jesus is later described by Paul and other Christian writers. So, it, it seems to me like they definitely were yearning for the Savior figure to come, especially under the specific idea that there was a certain amount of time that was going to pass and. And then he would arise, and it kind of seems like the emergence of this Jesus person um, seemed to correspond to, you know, um, correspond to when uh, uh, he was supposed to have come. Yeah, I think that makes sense. And you know, I think the idea of a resurrection with an empty tomb is really convenient because you don't have any evidence then. Yeah, no, I, I agree that the, 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 there would be no evidence. Yep, so basically I want to say that. I also want to say, because in the chat, some people were mentioning the Talmud, and I know like um, the Talmud came out after Judea was crushed by the Romans and was written down. That's considered the oral Torah. Um, there are some references to people with the name Yeshu, which is Aramaic for Yeshua, which we would call Joshua today. Um, and they weren't around the time of the period of Jesus. They were either before or after. Mm-hmm. So, and then the Christians in the middle, you know, Christian Europe and whatnot really was so anti-Semitic and, you know, essentially censored the Talmud. So, cause it didn't like references of somebody by the name of Jesus in the Talmud because they considered it blasphemous. So you can't really use the Talmud, I think, as anything reliable on that. Oh, I agree. It really confuses me when people use the Talmud to prove that Jesus existed because like the the one of the the, the Jesus that was like uh persecuted and killed uh by by the Jews uh through through stoning um he actually lived uh like in between 103 and like 80 BCE. So like it was over 100 years prior to when Jesus yep. supposedly lived. And a, a lot of people really fight back hard on that one. And it, it's actually quite surprising to me that that they use the Talmud in order – because there's like there's literally nothing in that particular story that maps to it, uh, that maps to the Jesus that we know from Christianity. So it's just kind of – it's weird. Yeah, it is. So anyway, um, thank you very much for the, the very interesting chat. I'll sign off and let other people have a chance. Okay. Awesome. Thank you, friend, for calling in. I really appreciate it. You bet. Have a great day. All right. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. All right. Uh, let's see. We currently don't have anybody uh, in uh, in the call line, which we have been going for a little bit more than an hour now. Um. Let's see. I did. Uh, I did notice some other other 
<laughs> other than more than a flame having a uh, having a <laughs> a meltdown. <laughs> um, I did notice that there were some people that were referencing. Uh, yeah, the guy who's got homeroom in his name saying the amount of disrespect you're showing to this caller makes clear what kind of person you are. No, I, I'm sorry, but I, I don't respect, um, uh, conspiracy theories about Freemasons and, and stuff. Yeah. I kind of feel like I should have, uh, I should have hung up on them kind of quick. <laughs> Oh, uh, I mean, I, I don't know. Did, did they let him in our discord? I don't know. The, the one link that I, that Sirnian, it was a, it was an attachment. Like it's a picture. Okay. So it's like not a link to our discord. Uh, that's actually, I guess, Sir, I don't know. Sirnian took a, uh, picture of his, uh, the back of his card. I don't know. I, you know, I'm not seeing. I'm not seeing the numbers that he's talking about. Uh, have him call in again and hang up on him even faster. <laughs> no, I'm not giving you fifteen fifteen minutes. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, YM7 says Jewish rabbis say their Messiah is coming after this year. Ah, that would be awesome. Uh, somebody said, I only know about the preacher Joshua, the one of the Bible, and obviously the historical re representation of most scholars. Yeah, but the problem is, is that you don't really have any evidence to suggest that he was an actual rabbi. Oh, no, thank you, Uhan, for, for doing that. Uh, okay, so Super Chats. Uhan says, Jesus exists in my bum bum fact. <laughs> he, he said another one says, the Freemasons stole his brain. And then also said, dude is a sovereign citizen. Oh, shit, I didn't know he was a sovereign citizen. That's kind of crazy. Thank you, Uhan, for the, the super chats. I really appreciated it. Uh, for some reason, I don't have the uh, – I can get the little browser. I should I should have had the, the browser thing up here, but I didn't. And now I'm not exactly sure where – oh, crap. Nope, that's the overlay. Shoot. Compelled unbeliever. By the way, Matt Powell will not debate with me on the existence of Santa. I promise to use Matt's arguments for God to prove that Santa exists. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine him not exactly being all all hip on on the idea of proving <laughs> doing that. Um. Yeah, Gerard. She's not my secretary. She's her own person. So quit talking to her like she's my fucking secretary. Okay. All right, so we got another caller on the phone. Hello, caller. Who do I have on the line? Hello, this is John. Uh, I'm kind of a unicorn, and I'm listening to your program, and it sounded kind of interesting. Uh, okay. I'm, uh, okay, I'm a 70-year-old second generation, probably third generation atheist. Oh, okay. Uh, I've 
I've never believed in anything in the supernatural ever. Okay. I've never believed in magic ever. And I was probably 50 years old before I really understood that there were Christians that actually believed. Okay. Um, I got a little different perspective, perhaps, on some things. I, I come to the conclusion that most theists believe uh, on the fact that their mother told them so, and she wouldn't lie to them, or some variation of that. Okay. So if, you know, if your parents believe, everybody know you know believes then you probably believe in fact almost certainly you do consequently almost every other atheist i've met uh is at at the ground a believer it was pounded into them not pounded in but if they were initially believers and then they have uh, come to no longer believe but that original uh, i don't like to call it indoctrination that seems kind of unfair but the initial teachings from their parents is still there uh, it, yeah. you know, a, a, a human doesn't really become a human in the womb uh, we uh, continue to grow, our brain continues to grow, and uh, it's a good while until we're able to you know, be a fully functional human being. And in the early years, you depend on your parents to supply you with information just to survive. Uh, okay. And I think those early teachings stay with you for life. Right. Uh, it, it, are, are you getting to a question of some kind that you have for me? Well, I, mostly I'd like comments on that. Uh, uh, the other, the, the second thing that I've been thinking of is it, it, uh, most atheism, it kind of comes down to uh, your idea of a God is ridiculous. And since you claim, you know, you, there is a God, the burden of proof is on you. But I think for most believers, they believe that everybody knows there's a God and if you don't know it, you're the oddball. You're the one that is weird. It's up to you to show why this fantastic belief you have is real. Okay. Um, it's so just, uh, are, are... trying to look at it from a different perspective. So are, are you wanting me to comment on the idea that uh most Christians are indoctrinated? I, I don't like to call it indoctrinated because I believe that their parents uh, taught them what they believed. Okay. And I don't know. Indoctrination is kind of an ugly word. It's like you're trying to teach somebody something that isn't true. But if you believe it's true, then you're just trying to import your truth. Well, so, so I, I would. Indoctrination is an ugly word. In fact, that's probably what it is, but it's a nasty way to say it. Well, I, I, obviously, I don't have a problem with being a little nasty. Um, so, I, I mean, I, I would definitely, I would definitely say that it, that that um, cri like generally, if if you're a Christian and you've been told that you're a Christian from birth and all that, you most likely are indoctrinated into a certain kind of belief. But all indoctrination means is that you're taught, uh, you're taught something uncritically and told to just believe it without actually uh, knowing like why you should believe it or uh, even being given the chance to question it. So, I mean, I, w I would agree that probably a majority of Christians out there are indoctrinated into the belief. I wouldn't say that atheists are likewise born atheists 
though, because I feel like atheism takes a very uh, conscious uh, effort to consider whether or not a God exists and then making the decision to not believe in God or, or making the conscious decision to not be convinced by something um, or, or just maybe not a conscious decision not to be convinced, but just you're, you, you're not convinced by it. There still has to be some kind of like actual action there to consider the religious claim first in order to consider yourself to be an atheist. Um, so I, I'm not exactly well, sure if, not it, if you're a second or third generation atheist, I mean, I came by my atheism, if you want to call it that, the same way that most Christians came by their Christianity. In that, uh, I, as a as a child, I would beg my mother to allow me to go to church with my friends because they had fun. They wanted to go, so I wanted to go too, and she did not like it. But it was like, okay. God, just go, but for God's sake, don't believe it, you know, that kind of thing. So I was brought up to believe, I mean, my mother was actually pretty vicious as an atheist. She used to pray on Jehovah's Witnesses. They were her hobby. Uh, So I came home from school very often to find my living room full of Jehovah's Witnesses and my mother there, and they're all eating cookies and drinking milk. And it was like, oh, God, here we go. And I, you know, <laughs> I'd go through. And and she would just eat them alive. You know, she was just horrible. Well, uh, so but I, that I'm was not your hobby. Right. Well, well so uh, <laughs> I, I'm not I'm not going to like uh, really trash anybody's parenting method. I mean, I personally wouldn't do that. I know for my son, uh, I've, I've not tried to push any kind of belief on him and I would implore anybody out there to not push uh, any kind of belief, whether that's belief or non-belief uh, onto their children. Um, and uh, I, I get that, that sometimes uh, there are people that, that do do that. Uh, but I, I, I ultimately disagree with the idea of forcing a child to believe one thing or another as far as like this particular context goes. Um, you know, uh, it, I've, I've made myself available to my son if, uh, you know, he ever starts questioning that kind of thing or, or anything like that. I'm, I've always let him know that I'm there to help him, uh, give him my perspective and, and, you know, help him develop his beliefs. Uh, but I've, I've really tried to not influence what he does and does not believe. Um, I do try to impart good information on him, uh, about, uh, reality. And so I usually back that up with, you know, that don't do this or this, this happens because of this and give him reasons and give him like critical things to think about as, as far as that goes. So, um, yeah, I, I disagree with forcing, uh, any belief or non-belief on children. I no, I agree with you, but I don't know that it's really avoidable. Uh, 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 you know, uh, children in order to survive, you know, uh, mimic their parents. They pay attention. They have to. Well, there's Otherwise, a difference. Our species would go extinct. Well, well, I mean, I don't know about that. Uh, uh, well, I, 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 I think that there's a very distinct thing between children mimicking their parents and the parents actively pushing some position on their children. Uh, obviously, Absolutely. children. Uh, obviously children are going to mimic their parents, but that is still, uh, that's still not their parents pushing that on their children. It's like, it's not pushing their children to mimic them. It's just what happens. Oh no. It, yes, absolutely. I believe that to the ground. I don't think it's necessary to force religion on a child. I think there, if everyone around them belongs to the religion, their parents belong to the religion, uh, I don't think it's a matter of anybody forcing anybody. You believe so, and so of course you do. Everybody else does. You know, why wouldn't you? If you didn't, you know, you're kind of strange. 
I, I don't think it's a matter of forcing anyone to, to believe anything. I think that's what makes, uh, you know, atheism uh, or becoming atheist so difficult because the children are uh, that are born of theists are theists. Uh, it's like it's not from birth. It's a learned thing, but they learned it from their surroundings. Um uh, uh, so to for an atheist to raise atheist children, I think is kind of an automatic thing. It's the same thing as a theist raising theist children. Well, so uh, so they so absorb what's around them. Well, I, I I will say this: that religion definitely has to be taught, and so. Uh, sure. You know, I, I think the distinction here is that religion has to be actively taught to children uh, and is often done in an uncritical manner. And whereas with atheism, it, you know, as far as a child being exposed to religion, I think that if you could have a child that is completely untouched by religion, the best that you could call them as a secular because they're not really concerned about religion. Um, and so because they have never considered like a religious question or religion in general, you can't necessarily call them an atheist because that requires some kind of actual interaction with the subject of religion. Uh, so, I mean, I would say, I would say that they start off secular and if they consider a religious claim, you know, and, and they dismiss it, then they could possibly be called an atheist, but it still requires that conscious consideration of, you know, whether or not you believe this. Um, and, and so, uh, I think that we're having a problem with the uh, definition. I mean, okay. my definition of theist, it was one that believes in a God or gods. Okay. An atheist is one who does not believe. Now, I don't think it takes any kind of action to not believe in something. Okay. I mean, there are any number of things that I don't believe in that I don't, and probably, uh, you know, millions of things that I don't even know I don't believe in until somebody would mention it. Well, you know, do you believe there's the, uh, you know, the proverbial teapot, you know, flying between the earth and Mars? Well, no, I don't. I didn't have to learn to not believe it. <laughs> well, right. <laughs> it didn't take a physical, you know. Like, uh, you know, it, cracking open books to say, no, nah, I really doubt there's a teapot up there. Well, yeah, but until like I, you wouldn't you wouldn't have called yourself an a teapotist until you were confronted with the question of whether or not there's a, a teapot out there. So, I mean, oh, well, that's true. I would not have called myself that, but I still would have been one. You see, I, I disagree because until you actually consider the particular question that that label actually poses, I don't think that you can rightfully uh, wear that label. Like you can't actually label the thing that until it considers the exact question that you that that the label is meant to address. So I I, I still feel like okay. it, it requires interaction with the question. Huh. That's a, that's an interesting uh, you know, perspective. I had not considered that. I just assumed that anyone that did not believe was someone who did not believe. You know, and if you don't know about something, how can you believe in it? Therefore, you are a non-believer in that whatever it is. Well, yeah, but saying but you're a non-believer was the active uh, uh, action, if you will, that non-belief required no action because you know you don't. Why would you believe in anything if you don't know it exists? Well, exactly, but that's what that's why I use the label secular because non-believer is far like let's let's take the context of Christianity. If somebody is a non-believer in Christianity, that does not. Uh, exactly equate to atheist because there are plenty oh, of people certainly. out there that are non-believers in Christianity. Certainly. Absolutely. Of course. You know, uh, uh, yeah. 
you know, a, a, an atheist is one that does not believe in gods uh, of any flavor. At okay. least uh, that is my definition. Okay. Well, I, I, I mean, I would agree that anybody that doesn't believe in any gods uh, would, would be considered an atheist, but I still feel like that requires interaction with the question of whether or not a god exists. Until that point, though, uh, yeah, I think the best label that you can, you can make out there is secular. Uh, and uh, I think that's the most accurate label. Uh, I get that there are some people out there that, that would use the label atheist for like um, – uh, babies or toddlers or pe people that just haven't interacted with the question. While I guess technically you could be true, like in labeling them that I think that it's, it's not exactly accurate because they haven't considered it. You could also, but, but another thing that kind of gets you into it with is like labeling inanimate objects, uh, atheists, you know, I, I feel like, um, you know, applying that label well, to those things uh, isn't exactly uh, accurate because they don't have the ability to consider it. And if they don't have the ability to consider it, how can you really apply that label? Uh, no, I understand that it is it is a, a tricky thing. Secularism is something I hadn't really considered. I generally consider that as it pertains to government. Uh, but uh, as far as belief and non-belief, that's not really a, a word I'd consider. I mean, I, I deal with the Gnosticism and, you know, and but being agnostic uh, with uh, 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 relating to knowledge. And then uh, theism, atheism uh, is regards belief. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, you know, most people say if they're intellectually honest, they would be an agnostic atheist because uh, to be otherwise, you're saying that, you know, there is no God. And I think that's unprovable. OK, uh, but uh, secularism as a third term, if you will, is something I hadn't considered. Thank you for that. I'll play with that a bit. Okay. Awesome. Well, I appreciate you calling in today so that we could have this discussion. I really, uh, I really do appreciate it. No, I've enjoyed your program. I'll uh, become a steady listener. I uh, promise. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I appreciate it, man. You no, have a good day and I guess I'll talk to you later. You okay. Give people a decent chance. Thank you very much and have a wonderful time. All right. See you later, man. All right, so we do have one last caller. I've, I've shut off all new calls, so this is going to be the last caller. I want to appreciate. I want to tell everybody that I appreciate you guys so much for joining in today and, and watching uh, watching us talk about this kind of stuff. Um, so we uh, we've got one last caller in here, and we're going to talk to them, and then we're going to be out of here. So um, let's see. All right, uh, hello. Who do I have? It is you, Han. I actually have something relevant to that last phone call. Oh, okay. Hey there, Uhan. <laughs> hey, What's up? Um, I was one of those people born secular. Oh, Didn't yeah? Didn't even know what the word atheism was until I was like 20-something. Oh, really? Awesome. So I didn't believe in a god, but I didn't know what I wasn't believing in. Right. That's interesting. So it is possible that yeah, I didn't start using the word atheism until... I learned about like an actual religion. Like, nope, I don't believe that. Oh, okay. So, so, so yeah, I guess confirming that. Go ahead. No, no, God. Well, I, so I mean, it's it, it's very interesting uh, hearing that from that perspective because you know, I me growing up in the South down here, I've always been confronted with like God and and religion in general. So I mean, it, it's kind of interesting to hear from the perspective of somebody that kind of grew up in a, in, a, in a secular home. Uh, so like, it just was it, it like never got brought up at all. No, no. Wow, like no, it, it was just yeah. Like even at school? Um, no, not that I can even remember. Hmm, that's interesting because, like, yeah. down here, uh, down here, uh, I mean, people talk about church and everything like that all the time. Like, uh, uh, like other kids 
talk about that kind of thing in school. And I've, I've had to, you know, talk with Xander on occasion about things that he's heard other people say and, um, trying to, trying to handle those situations delicately. So it's kind of interesting to hear that, that there are some portions of, uh, society that, uh, don't, don't revolve around religion. Yep. I mean, I went to school in like a city in a city school in Pennsylvania. So I don't know. The North has anything to do with it versus the South. Yeah. Well, I mean, generally uh, in, in the North, in the more liberal areas, I guess, uh, you know, the, there's a lot less oh, adherence wow. to religion. I, I don't, I don't know if maybe that described your area when you were growing up or not, but. Yeah. I mean, just churches wasn't really something I heard about. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Well, I, yeah, I really just confirming that. Yeah. Oh, yeah, you were just confirming secular, not not an atheist? <laughs> yep, until I started learning about religions, and now I can say, yeah, I don't believe that crap. So, yeah, I'm an atheist now. <laughs> wow. That's cool. I'm, I'm, You know, I should really have you on for, like, an interview or something like that one day uh, there, Uhan. Because I mean that it's it it sounds pretty interesting just to just to get your perspective on what it was like to, you know, uh, your like your your first introduction to religion and and how you kind of coped with that uh, would be kind of interesting. So may, maybe uh, I don't know if you'd be yeah. interested. Uh, we could set that up one day. Yeah, yeah, it's cool. Awesome. Well, thank you, Uhan, for calling in, and uh, I appreciate yeah. you listening to the show and everything like that. And uh, I guess uh, you drive safe. I think I hear your 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 thing of flashing. Yep, I just parked, so I'm good. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Awesome, man. I'll All talk right. to you later, okay? All right. Bye. Bye. All right. Awesome. What well, we just got done. Let me actually in the show right now. Boom. There we go. Confirm and end show. There we go. Shows offline. Awesome. Thank you guys so much for, for, for hanging out with me today. We had a really, we had some really good callers. Um, uh, the first caller that called in or not first caller, but maybe the second caller. Um, I actually, uh, I let him know, uh, over Twitter because he followed me and messaged me on Twitter that I was doing the, the pod or the, the call in show today. I think his name was Mark. Yeah. Mark. Um, it was really awesome to talk to him cause he gave me some things to sort of, uh, really brush up on like, uh, Ignatius of Antioch and stuff like that. So, uh, it was really interesting. Uh, I appreciate everybody joining in today. If you, uh, are going to be leaving out, which I'm going to be leaving out too, uh, definitely smash that like button right now. Uh, we got, it looks like most people that are, that have been concurrently watching, uh, have also smashed that like button. So everybody that hasn't smashed the like button, smash the like button before you leave out. And uh, I guess I'll be talking to you guys later. Monday, um, we have Bodybuilders for Christ making a case for God existing. And we're going to have a special guest to help us with that. You may know him as Brocephus. So we got a special special Brocephus thing on Monday. And then on Wednesday, we're going to stir up some drama. So it, 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 it's, it's some drama that's been going on that I haven't exactly addressed on the channel, but we will be addressing it on Wednesday. So, uh, I guess we will, uh, see you guys next week. Don't forget to stand up and use your voice. Bye heathens. <laughs>